Hi, welcome to the second part of the lecture dealing with government evolution and theory of the early modern period of Europe. This portion of the lecture will, of course, take a look at the creation and kind of evolution of constitutionalism as it pertains to the European model of the 16 and 1700s and beyond. Constitutionalism is going to be a counterbalance or an opposite balance to the, to the kind of the evolution and the political changes that were taking place in places like Spain and France as they were looking to consolidate their, uh, their go government or royal authority. The place we're going to take a look at to kind of start our discussion of constitutionalism is the country of England. England has a lot of past historical precedents which made it the prime place for constitutionalism to be born. Uh, as the slide states, their constitutionalism is best defined as the balance of government authority and personal liberty. And what that means in, in basic terms is that it's an ideal in which a government will be limited in terms of its power and authority over the individual when it comes to personal choices. So uh, we asked the first question, why England? And England has several, several reasons why it was a prime area for constitutionalism to be born. Uh, going way back in time, taking a look at 1215, we have the creation of a document and a political structure known as the Magna Carta. Now, the Magna Carta, while it was a document only pertaining to nobles in 1215, it set kind of the groundwork and framework for the birth of early modern and modern constitutionalism. The Magna Carta primarily outlined three basic rules or laws or rights that the nobles enjoyed. The first rule was uh, the idea that the monarchy could not increase taxation without meeting with the nobles first and basically getting their, uh, getting their approval. And I do apologize for moving the screen there. I just noticed it was a little bit off center. So basically, um, the first kind of fundamental right that the Magna Carta gave the nobles was the ability to kind of manage or control the finances of the monarchy when it came in the form of land taxes. A second rule, which is very fundamental to the American cultural system, is the idea that the monarchy could not judge cases against nobles, but rather they had to rely upon a jury of nobles to kind of determine innocence or guilt. Uh, this was an extremely important uh, right, as well as a groundbreaking change. Um, if we take a look at the evolution of governments from the earliest civilizations forward, uh, the right of the government, of in fact the monarchy, to dispense justice was a fundamental right that was gained by um, the King Hammurabi approximately in the year 2000 BCE. And, and that, that government right had been retained for more than 3,000 years as kind of an extremely significant pillar of government power and authority. And when King John, King of England in 1215, when he signed the Magna Carta, it was the first time that the monarchy or a government system had actually given up that right to dispense justice. So that was a very fundamental and, and significant breakthrough in the evolution of constitutionalism. Uh, last but not least, point number B, Parliament. Parliament was established within the Magna Carta. And what this establishment meant was that the nobles had the right to assemble and meet with the monarchy, meet with the king or queen, once a year to basically uh, debate problems, to debate their concerns, and the monarchy had to listen. They didn't necessarily have to act but they at least had to listen and give a voice to the nobles of England. So the Magna Carta, which established these three basic rights, and then the parliament meetings that took place every year afterward, it set up a fruitful area for this beginning idea of the balance of government authority and personal liberty. Uh, point number C is a bit uh, more complex to discuss. Uh, it refers to the idea of common law. And, and very basically, this is not a law class, but very basically common law is a law or a practice that grows out of 
the population's kind of maintenance or the population's ability and the way that they handle things. Uh, common law is opposed to royal law. And in the form of royal law, a king would establish a law and then enforce it. But in, in the context of common law, a law in terms of common law starts with people's practices and then eventually elevates itself up to becoming a law enforced by the government. Now, the fundamental difference here is in terms of control. In royal law, the king controls the establishment of the law and its implementation. But in common law, the common law starts lower and then the establishment follows an upward pattern, which means the king does not have control of its establishment or its evolution. So, um, you know, the Magna Carta and the Three Rights, the, the actions of Parliament over the course of centuries, and this English kind of dedication to this idea of common law were all components that weakened the authority and power of the English government to kind of maintain things. Now, if you remember back to the previous lecture, we talked about one of the keys of absolutism was the regulation of religion. And in England, the religious situation was a problem for that kind of power-based idea. Uh, there was no overwhelming majority in terms of a religious faction within England. Uh, the primary group, the, the Church of England, the Anglican Church as it is called today, that was approximately about 50 to 60 percent of the population. Um, Roman Catholics made up about 30 to 35 percent, and then about 15 to 20 percent of the population were other Christian Protestant groups. But what that meant in terms of the long-term uh, outlook or the long-term effect upon constitutionalism was that the English government, the English monarchy, could never really favor one group at the expense of the other two. If it did that, it would wind up alienating almost half of its population, which would not allow the English government to really function in the way it wanted to. And so what the English monarchs had to do is they had to basically include or at least utilize all three segments of the population to kind of make things work. The maximum amount of power that they could kind of get from that situation was the ability to try and play the religions off one another so that they didn't actually focus on what the monarchy was doing. Now, in terms of our rulers of England, uh, a lot of the birth of constitutionalism does have to deal with the actual physical individuals that were the kings and queens of Europe, or excuse me, of England in the 15 and 1600s. Uh, Henry VIII, uh, as he's listed there, was a very powerful ruler, but most of the power that he had built up was not able to be passed down because he had a very unclear succession. His, his uh, son, Edward VI, died while still a minor. He was only king for six years. And then we have uh, his daughters taking over, Mary Tudor and Elizabeth Tudor, who both were not able to secure a successful succession of kings and queens. And so what we have is we have very different perspectives, different rulers, almost having to start from scratch to try and build up that absolute based power structure. And if you remember, particularly from the example of France, the French monarchs, Henry IV, Louis XIII, and Louis XIV, had a very stable succession and a very long kind of period of reign. If you remember, Louis XIV was king for over 70 years, which that was an extremely stable period in which to try to build that absolute monarchy. Now, in terms of the details of these kings uh, and queens, uh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll leave that to the, uh, to the online source materials that can give you very detailed histories. But the overall result of the Tudor dynasty is its eventual failure and its inability to create a substantial and stable succession of its ruling members. Now, uh, with the death of Elizabeth I, uh, we have then a transition to the kings of Scotland who were then basically transported over and became, became kings of Scotland and England. 
and this dynasty is referred to as the Stuart family. But the Stuart family increasingly failed at being able to manage the English nobility. Um, James I Stuart was fairly adept. He was pretty good at playing off the religious issues. Uh, he was, himself was, in fact, a Protestant. But if you know your history in terms of America, it was actually during his reign that he began to um, persecute and kind of tighten the grasp on smaller Puritan pilgrim groups, other pure, uh, Protestant groups in England. Now, all of this kind of ability or the attempt to create a stronger monarchy came to a, came to a head in the reign of Charles I Stuart. Charles I um, began to, as you can see from the outline, he lost control of the three primary areas he was supposed to rule. We have a brief civil war in Scotland, which forced him to increase taxation on the English nobles in an attempt to kind of pay for that. A civil war broke out in, in Ireland, which brought the financial problems of Charles to a, to a focal point. When Charles tried to increase taxation on the English nobles again, that led to a civil war in England, which eventually led to Charles I Stuart's arrest and his execution as a traitor to England. And this is an extremely important uh, detail. Charles I Stuart was the first European monarch to be executed as a traitor to his own government, to his own people. And if we contrast that with the idea that was going on in France, in which Louis XIV said that he was the state, and therefore, of course, by logical extension, could not betray the state because he couldn't betray himself, that, that, that shows kind of a diverging path of government theory when it comes to absolutism and constitutionalism. Now, with the death of Charles I Stuart, we had a period in which the nobles tried to run England without a king. Uh, the first period is called the Interregnum from 1641 to 1653, and that was a period in time in which Parliament ran England without a king. Now, eventually that began to f kind of decay, and it was actually usurped by the general Oliver Cromwell and his kind of uh, dominant personality. Cromwell would set up what's called the Protectorate, which was a, a kind of a monarchy, which ruled from 1653 to 1658. Uh, it's during this time that he tried to implement a very strict Puritan-based theory of government, but as the outline shows, uh, it lasted only as long as Cromwell himself was viable. When Cromwell died in 58, we had the collapse of his government, and then we had the restoration of the monarchy. But when the monarchy was restored, it was restored to a political situation in which Parliament was extremely powerful and had been used to being powerful. Just to kind of finish the story on that, of course, Charles II son of Charles I, was returned to the monarchy and ruled England for about 25 years. And then James II, his son, took over in 1685. However, due to his religious stance on Catholicism, uh, there was a, a backlash of the nobility, a backlash of Parliament. And then we have an event which is called the Glorious Revolution. And it's really through the Glorious Revolution that we have the end of a kind of absolute attempted monarchy of England. The Parliament, basically, because they were dissatisfied with James II, they issued a letter and invited James's sister, Mary Stuart, to basically come to England and be queen with her husband, William of Orange, a, a place in Holland. They invited those two people to come over and become the king and queen of England. But there were rules, there were actual, a contract set of rules that Mary and William, or William and Mary, had to basically follow to, in order for Parliament to endorse them as the rulers of England. So we call the Glorious Revolution a bloodless coup because uh, when James was faced with a, a civil war again on the part of the nobles, 
James II left England. He basically gave up his, his claim to the throne of England, and he stepped down. And when William and Mary came in, they actually, when they came in, they had to sign a Bill of Rights, which ensured the, you know, it ensured certain rights to the nobility and to the, to the upper and middle class of English citizens, that they would have a certain amount of rights, one of which would be the right to have religious freedom. Uh, that was the Tolerance Act of 1689. Uh, they signed several rights which gave ironclad rights to the people of England at the expense of royal power. And so we see the Glorious Revolution as kind of the triumph of constitutionalism in which now from that point forward, England would be a, a combination of a monarchy, a very weak monarchy, which would then be underpined and ruled or kind of controlled by a parliament-based system of government. And just to give you an idea of what happened because of that, I'm going to move this dialogue box a minute. Um, in order to kind of justify this, the British nobility and the government of England employed the services of a political thinker by the name of John Locke. And John Locke basically set out an ideal form of government in which government was a contract. That wasn't a new idea. That was an old idea. But it was actually uh, Locke's spin on that, his new spin, was that government was a contract made daily. That not only did people have to follow the government, pay their taxes, and do what they were supposed to do, but the government actually had a requirement of inaction. It had to safeguard, as the outline states, it had to safeguard life, liberty, and property, or as Thomas Jefferson would, would more eloquently quote it maybe, the pursuit of happiness. But the, the British government had the obligation to safeguard an individual's rights to life, liberty, and property. And because of that, that is where we begin to have this established balance between government authority and individual or personal liberty. Now, part of this theoretical justification for the government of England was also the argument that if a government did not fulfill those obligations, that the people governed under that system of government had the right and the responsibility to revolt against the government, tear it down, and make a new government. We call that the right of revolution. And so for the first time in human history, ever since we have the origins of the government structures that were created thousands of years prior to the modern era, we had this theoretical justification for the need and the obligation of political revolution. And that is key because up until 1688, we might have had political changes in government, but we hadn't seen an actual revolution in which the ideal or the style of government was fundamentally changed. So we didn't have any of those prior to 1688, but after 1688 and John Locke, we would have more than a dozen as governments underwent revolution and formed new styles and new theories of government to kind of govern the people. So the, the Glorious Revolution of 1688 is a very primary event which would then kind of spark the foundation of constitutionalism. It would cement constitutionalism and it would also provide a theoretical framework for why it could be accomplished. And all of those facets were extremely important because, again, as you know, American government was based on a British model. The, the, the 13 colonies that formed the first American government were based out of the English colonies, and they had incorporated and, and, basically indoctrin and, and had basically been indoctrinated with John Locke's theory of government. And so what they did in 1776 was they just simply applied Locke's argument to the British parliamentary government, and they used Locke's arguments to justify their revolution against an English constitutional system. And once the Americans did it, the French would wind up doing it, and then we have a whole number of revolutions that took place in the 1820s, 1830s, and beyond. And we'll see those revolutions when we get to, the, to that point in our lecture series. 
we'll talk again, we'll return again to this idea of revolution a couple of times, we'll return to it, and we'll talk about how it continued to evolve over the course of a couple centuries. I hope this lecture has been informative. Once again, I thank you for taking the time to listen to it and watch it, and I look forward to seeing you again in, in video format. Thank you.